This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade. It looks like one of those scenes of an old building being purposely dynamited and blown. When we are successful, I'm and just a patsy, and we will be. We're ready to make, uh, to come to the microphone, so we'll listen up. A new world order. So my name's Robbie Parker. It might have appeared that way, but from my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Live from the Media Broadcasting Center. 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 Is my return guest, Benton Bradbury, the author of The Myth of German Villainy. It turns out his book, which was published in 2012, has been extremely successful. He sold over 20,000 copies. It's available on Amazon.com and other websites. And as you follow through his continuation of his analysis of what actually happened before and during World War II, you may be inspired to follow up by learning more. Man, it's just terrific to have you back. Welcome to The Real Deal again. Thanks, Jim. Glad to be back. I had suggested to you, of course, that we might backtrack just a bit to create an overlap with your last uh, presentation, uh, which was about a month ago. And uh, you thought the Polish corridor issue was a good place to resume. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Um... Let's uh, start with um, uh, Adolf Hitler when he became chancellor in 1933. One of his goals was to throw off the fetters of the Versailles Treaty, which had uh, impoverished Germany and, uh, and made Germans virtual s slaves. And Hitler worked from the day he became chancellor um, until the end to put Germany back together again. Large chunks of Germany, including uh, the populations, were given to other countries. And one by one by one, uh, he brought in the Sudeten Germans. He brought in the, uh, he got Memel back from Lithuania. He got uh, uh, Austria annexed uh, to Germany. All of this without firing a shot. And he underwent uh, extreme uh, uh, criticism and negative propaganda from the world Jewish press, actually. We'll get into that a little bit later, too. Uh, calling each one of these an aggressive act. And the, the propaganda said that Hitler has to be stopped. He's trying to take over Europe, and he's trying to, uh, wants to take over the world, which was nonsense. He made it clear what he wanted to do. He wanted to put Germany back together again. And when we come to Poland, this is the last piece of the puzzle. And he made it clear that he intended to do something about Poland. So this should not have been a surprise to anybody, but it was portrayed that way. Now, uh, when Poland was uh, reconstituted as a nation state at the end of World War I, large, uh, large uh, chunks of Germany were taken from Germany and given to Poland, which included the German population. And this Polish corridor that you see here uh, used yeah, to be. Let's go to the first slide, chance. Yes. Yeah. Go, there. go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, the Polish corridor used to be West uh, Prussia and then part of Silesia, and now it belonged to Poland. But what it did was cut Germany in two, and it isolated East uh, Prussia. What Hitler proposed to do, and he was very moderate in what he asked for. Now, Dan, let me say that Danzig, the city of Danzig, about two and a half million people, was an ancient German city, uh, part of the old Hanseatic League, very German, about 96% uh, of the population were ethnic German-speaking Germans. He wanted, and that had been put under the United Nations and uh, made available to the uh, Poles uh, to use the port facilities. That's what the po Polish quarter was all about, was to give Poland uh, uh, access to the Baltic Sea for trade purposes. Hitler said, I want Danzig back. And the Danzig people wanted to rejoin Germany. 
and it didn't belong to Poland anyway. It wasn't taking anything from Poland. It was under this. It was an international city under the uh, supervision of the League of Nations. And Hitler also proposed. He said he would not demand the Polish border back, but what he wanted to do was build a sealed highway and a sea 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 reconnect East Prussia because it was very difficult for East Prussians to find their way into Germany and to go back and forth. These were very moderate uh, uh, requests, not yet even demands. And the Poles at first uh, negotiated with them, but finally uh, they were encouraged by the British, the warmongers in Britain, and the Roosevelt administration, uh, who were bent on, I'll explain later why, bent on having a war with Germany. They advised the Poles not to negotiate anymore. And so uh, you had uh, this guy. Uh, are, are they seeing my slides or? Yeah, we're seeing them. Yeah, OK. This guy, uh, Edvard Rydz Smigli, was a marshal of Poland. And he was a very belligerent uh, a megalomaniac. Uh, in, and he, he was hostile toward Germany. Now, the image of um, uh, of the relationship between Poland and Germany at this time is a very powerful Germany intimidating a little weak of Poland. That was not the truth. The Polish army at this time, they had a long military tradition, much like the Prussians. The Polish army at this time is actually bigger than the German army and it was very well equipped. And these guys like uh, uh, Ridd Smigli and, and a lot of the other Polish officers had a very hostile, a belligerent attitude toward Germany at this time. So it's not uh, what people think. Here's German, uh, Polish tanks. They were at least as good as the German tanks. Now, let's see. Uh, and Poland's uh, army was actually larger than Germany's. Yes, that is that is correct. And here, uh, Halifax were agitating for war with Germany. And so was uh, this guy, Roosevelt, and his uh, Agent provocateur Ambassador William Bullitt, it was his ambassador at large in Europe and ambassador to France. And he um, and Roosevelt conversed on the telephone daily from France to uh, America. And he took orders from Roosevelt. And Roosevelt had directed him to try to provoke a war with uh, Poland. Was there Zionist pressure to? to... Yes. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, both. Um, uh, the, the Roosevelt administration was full from top to bottom, uh, one end to the other, of com communist sympath communist of Jews with communist sympathies or were outright uh, communists. And they, uh, for example, his famous brain trust, the 15 uh, powerful people who advised Churchill of his 15 member brain trust, eight of them were Jews. So he was surrounded by Jews who were constantly pressing him for war against Germany. Now, uh, and, and the Jewish interest in penalizing Hitler, I mean, it's strange that Judea declared war on Germany in 1933. What do you take to be the deeper roots of this animosity? Well, okay, yeah, that, that bears a bit of explaining. Uh, the Jews portray themselves, did then and do now, as the uh, ultimate victim group of history, as innocent, harmless people who are constantly being prejudiced against, ex uh, oppressed, exterminated for no reason whatsoever except that they're Jews. Nonsense. The Jews. When World War I ended in Germany, they were very powerful in Germany, more powerful than anywhere else, though they were also very powerful in Great Britain and America and France. Roughly as a lobbying group, as a exerting yeah. political pressure. They, they, the Jewish diaspora, they, they're spread out all over the world, in, all the, particularly Europe, in small populations, usually one or two percent of the population of the country. But they tend to get high educations. They are a high IQ uh, group of people. And they work intensely together. And they have numerous, numerous interweaving, overlapping organizations worldwide to keep track of all the Jews that live in various countries. And they considered themselves the international nation of Israel before they actually had a state of Israel. And they had national interests. 
And they tended to work their way into high office and they worked, uh, they, they did what was best for Jews. And they tended to uh, work together and help each other, push each other up the ladder. And if a Jew got a job in, in government where he had the power to hire people, he began to bring in Jews quietly and push the Gentiles out until his whole office was eventually filled up with Jews. That's how they work. And uh, when World War I uh, ended, uh, the, the Kaiser went across the border and took up residency in the Netherlands, and they created the, a republic. Uh, it used to be a monarchy, now it was a republic in Germany called the Weimar Republic. And one of the things they did was lift all restrictions on Jews in Germany. And so these Jews, they were only nine-tenths of one percent of the population of Germany, flooded into the government to the point that they finally controlled the government. They flooded into all institutions in Germany. They controlled the press, um, um, the uh, in news and information media. They controlled uh, finance and banking. They controlled, they owned the central bank that provided the money for the uh, government. They, lent, they printed the money, lent it to the government at, at interest. That's how central banks work. Jews own all of that. They own movie making, they own uh, stage plays. Um, um, what else? They were big in trade and, uh, and um, wholesale business and this kind of stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll take a minute because it, you need to understand uh, how these people work. Jews are small enclaves, paras parasitic enclaves in host populations and they avoid wealth-creating industries. Now, what are wealth-creating industries? According to Adam Smith, the famous uh, English economist back in 1700s, he said that a wealth-creating industry is where you take a raw material and you apply labor to it to create a product that has value. Okay, uh, what are wealth-creating industries? Farming, fishing, um, mining, uh, oil drilling. Manufacturing. Uh, and manufacturing is the big one, but the Jews tended to avoid those. They were not wealth creators, they were wealth extractors. They were in finance where they earned interest, they were in wholesale where they earned uh, uh, profit, and they were in, uh, uh, in they were- this was, like their, this was like their area of specialization. Yeah, and they flocked together in cities, they were not rural, rural people, and they were really, Parasitic. They extracted wealth out of every economy they're in, and they don't create anything. They do the same thing in this country today. They make billions. They produce nothing. Okay, so that was the case in, in Weimar, Germany. Now, we, uh, the Versailles Treaty required Germany to pay horrendous reparations, mainly to France and, I guess, Belgium. And uh, they couldn't pay it. They didn't have the means of paying it. And in night, but they were allowed to pay in marks. That was a big oversight in requiring them to pay uh, reparations. So in 1923, France invaded the Rhineland to enforce the payment of these uh, reparations. So Germany started to print money and it got out of hand and it got this spiraling inflation to the point that the money, money was worthless. It took a wheelbarrow load of uh, marks to buy a, a loaf of bread, for example. Well, who got rich off of this? The German middle class, the German people, the economy was wiped out, their savings wiped out, but the Jews got rich off of this. People had to feed their families, and so they had to sell all, all, everything they owned, personal things like their furniture, their clothing, dish, even dishes, to pawn shops. Now, who owned the pawn shops? Jews. But then the people who had access to foreign currencies, like the uh, particularly American dollar, and again, this was Jews, they controlled finance, were able to come in and buy up real estate at pennies on the mark or pennies on the dollar. You could buy a German farm at the height of this uh, runaway inflation for about 150 American dollars, if you can believe it. So that by the time this thing worked itself out, this inflation, Jews had owned almost not quite half of the real estate in Germany. Yet there were. So it could, it could be said, therefore, that many of Hitler's reforms really were attempting to restore balance and the, the proper ownership of the German people to their own property 
which had been usurped, as it were, by clever financing by a group that really didn't have the interests in Germany at heart so much as they did promoting their own uh, tribal uh, interests and, and welfare. Well said, exactly so. This was the, represented the biggest transfer of wealth in the history of Germany from one group to another, that is from the Germans to the Jews, who were less than 1% of the population. The Jews got wealthy off it. It was followed by the uh, 1929 worldwide uh, depression, which hit, which hit Germany much harder than it did in the United States. And the Jews manipulated the finances and, and, and made money even off the depression also. And the German people deeply resented this, and it caused a very strong anti-Semitic feelings in Germany. Now, uh, let me describe how things were when, uh, when Hitler came to power in 1933. Germany was uh, in the depths of the depression. 30% uh, of the German workforce was out of work. People were starving to death. The economy was on the point of collapse. Uh, in, in the three years before Hitler became chancellor, 250,000 Germans had committed suicide out of despair. Uh, the birth rate was almost zero. So Hitler comes into power. Uh, he becomes chancellor. And, and the gov everything's in chaos. You've got multiple uh, political parties with politicians all squabbling with each other and working at cross purposes. Nobody can make a decision. Uh, the legislative process didn't work anymore, and Hitler is powerless. He can't do anything. So he goes before the Reichstag, and he makes a speech. He said, German people, we've got to make some decisions to correct these problems, that Germany, fix Germany's problems. Give me four years of dictatorial authority to make decisions, and I will do my best to revive Germany. So the Reichstag voted for him overwhelmingly. This was in March uh, 23rd, 1933. The very next day, they, this was called the Enabling Act. The Reichstag gave him these powers. The very next day, international Jewry declared total war against Germany. And it was in, in the papers. And I, I have a picture of it somewhere. Oh, no, no, I've seen it. I've seen it. I'm just astonished to learn that Judea had declared war on Germany in 1933. Fairly astonishing. You don't and, read about that in the history books. And in, in the officially, according to the official history, the beginning of World War II was Germany's invasion of Poland, which was nonsense. The real beginning of World War II was when international Jewry declared war on Germany. Yeah, so 1933. Yeah, and there was a they they owned they owned and controlled banking and finance in the Western world. So they had the power to wage a financial war against Germany. They, uh, they had tremendous influence in the other nations that, that, that they would want to become involved. I mean, we see a pattern here because 9-11, Ben, I'm not presuming you're a student, but 9-11 was arranged in our transform American foreign policy from one in which we never attacked any country that had not attacked us first at least officially, the one in which we became an aggressor nation and began taking out the modern Arab states that served as a counterbalance to Israel's influence in the Middle East. The whole 9-11 was set up to drag the United States into doing Israel's dirty work. The Pearl Harbor event, yeah. I'm on board with you on that. That's all called no, New Pearl Harbor, right. All promoted by the CIA, the neocons of the Department of Defense, most of whom had come from Project for a New American Century, and were dual U.S. Israeli citizens and the most sawed. It originated in the fertile imagination of Benjamin Netanyahu, who had a conference already in Jerusalem and published a book in 1987 about how uh, terrorism, how the West can win, when no one in the West had even thought about terrorism. That's right. Okay, so anyway, back to the, uh, they declared this uh, war on, on Germany, uh, and it was a war, of, a financial war, also a boycott war, they organized boycotts in every city where Jews existed in Europe and America, and they not only just refused to buy, uh, Jews refused to buy German goods, they intimidated other people from doing it. They uh, cut off uh, credit from the central bank in Germany. They refused to finance the government anymore. They refused to finance German trade. 
Okay, so Hitler said about immediately, he had this brilliant guy, Helmar Schacht, who was kind of like the Secretary of the Treasury, the finance minister, and they worked together, and he said, we don't need the German Central Bank uh, to give us, lend us money. The government will uh, print the money, and therefore no interest and no national debt. He then... Uh, this sounds to me like uh, circumventing the Fed which has been a pain on the history of America since its founding in 1913. What Senator Ron Paul, I read his book, End the Fed, he's been yeah. calling, which is exactly what Hitler did. Yes. We ought, we ought to know more about what Hitler did back in those days. Well, see, Hitler's role has been so grossly distorted to make him out to be, uh, you know, just a, 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 a genocidal, uh, military, you know, aggressor, eager to take up territory with no explanation of the background and history you provide, so that most Americans have a totally warped impression of Hitler's role in history. Yeah, he was the evil monster of history. He wasn't anything of the kind. But anyway, they didn't, they, the Jewish banks refused to finance uh, trade that the Germans were involved in, so they set up a barter system, like a shipload of German coal in exchange for a shipload of Argentine wheat, uh, for example. They set up a system of autarky, that's uh, economic uh, self-sufficiency, that's what the term means. And uh, he said that anything that can be manufactured in Germany would be manufactured in Germany regardless of the cost. He erected a tariff wall. Who wants to do that? Pat Buchanan, maybe Donald Trump. Yes. And it worked miraculously. The factory started to open again. The people went back to work. Uh, they started to rebuild the infrastructure. They built the Audubon system. They built a Volkswagen car. And in no time at all, uh, they had a labor shortage in Germany. They went from 30% unemployment to a labor shortage. And the highest standard of living in the world and the highest incidence, so I've read, of private ownership of cars, the Volkswagen, in the world. So, and I've heard estimates of the true unemployment in the rate in this country is around 40 45%. It's certainly not five. Uh, oh, it's it, a they, <laughs> they don't count anyone who ceased looking for work. And exactly. you can only look for work, you know, for a certain period of time before you become depleted emotionally and recognize the jig is up for you. But anyway, this was the biggest, most miraculous economic turnaround in history that occurred. And part of the reason that he was able to do that is because he started to push the Jews out of positions of power in Germany. He purged them out of the government, and he started to push them out of all other institutions, and he began to uh, encourage them, uh, pressure them to immigrate out of the country. And that is Hitler's great sin, and that was the motivating force uh, to which caused World War II. International Jewry was not going to tolerate this, and so they... I think the point that, they, that Judea declared war on Germany in 1933 is absolutely pivotal. We have to understand that and the reasons behind it, which you're elaborating so lucidly, which makes of course, no great sense why, for example, here I'm looking at a slide of he Henry Morgenthau Jr., Roosevelt's Jewish Treasury Secretary, which most Americans would naively not understand. You know, why would it matter that he was Jewish? We like to think uh, your, your, your race or your religion or your ethnic origin don't matter. But in this instance, actually, it does. He had a pathological hatred for the German people and constantly agitated for war. Not only that, his assistant uh, secretary of the Treasury was... Uh, Harry uh, Dexter White, who was also Jewish and who also agitated for war. And then, then let's, while we're talking about that, let's go down to Joseph P. Kennedy, who was uh, Roosevelt's ambassador to Great Britain and the father of our own President Kennedy. He was opposed to this uh, push for war against uh, Germany. He saw no reason at all for us to have hostile relations with Germany. Our interests did not conflict. And so he was pushed out of government, by the way. He was, uh, Anyone who could father kids like Junior and, and, and Jack and Bobby and Teddy is, has got a lot going for him, in my opinion, Ben. Yeah. Okay, uh, I guess I should follow the slides here. This is a, uh, is a matter of 
kind of a convenience for both sides. Uh, the Soviet Union and Germany made a pact in uh, August 23rd, 1939, a non-aggression pact. Uh, yeah, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, I think. Uh, well, you went it, back and covered a lot of things you'd covered in your first presentation, Ben. Yeah. Oh, you okay. know, I, I think you did a good job in reminding us, so it's okay to pick up here. You began yeah. again with the Polish corridor issue. I think you've done a good job of explaining what was going on. Hitler wanted to make connections with Danzig. He had the idea for uh, an elevated roadway and so forth. And uh, the Poles were willing to negotiate until uh, foreign influences pressured them to stop negotiating with Hitler. And, and then the British government and the French government gave them a guarantee, the Poles, that if, if uh, Germany were to invade Poland, that France and Britain would declare war on Germany. Now, that was a stupid guarantee. I mean, uh, maybe not stupid. It was France and Britain and the United States and the Soviet Union all wanted a war with Germany and they wanted to destroy Germany. And they were all pressured to, into this mode of thinking by uh, the Jews who virtually controlled the politicians in all of these countries. Now, the people of America... Yeah, that, that's, that's such a terribly important point in, in terms of your analysis, Ben, uh, that, that it has to be understood that there was a, a kind of common al allegiance between all these individuals distributed through different nations because of their uh, genetic heritage, because they were members of, as many would put it, the same tribe, and they were ultimately interested in advancing the interests of the tribe. When the tribe declared war on Germany, they wanted to make sure that it would be done by all the foreign powers they could influence, and they went about doing it. So from 1933 right up to the war, uh, the real war, and through the uh, war, uh, the Jews, international Jewry, re waged this relentless financial boycott uh, and uh, propaganda war against Germany, but they were also working feverishly pushing the, their puppet leaders of these different countries, Britain, France, uh, United States, and, and Russia, they controlled Russia, by the way, uh, at that time completely, to push them into a shooting war with Germany. They were already waging. Now, there weren't enough Jews in the world to invade, you know, to have a shooting war, but somebody said one time uh, that the national anthem of international Jewry ought to be onward Christian soldiers. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard well, of that. The Bush family has this policy of o OPM, other people's money. They don't like to invest their own, but other people's money. And I think what you're talking about is a policy of other people's blood, other people's sweat, other people's tears, which yes. was illustrated so very clearly with 9-11. And, and, and the plan that Wesley Clark would outline to us to take out the governments of seven different countries in the next five years, beginning with Iraq and Libya, ending with Syria and Iran. I mean, this was a, this was a Zionist design plan, man. So exactly. I know all that. After 9-11 and even surrounding 9-11, we seem to be seeing something that approximates a replication of what we saw in earlier stages of history attempting to defeat Germany as opposed to these modern Arab states. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, Hitler had tried to negotiate uh, these uh, agreements with Poland, and they refused to negotiate at all. But more than that, the tension, as, the, as the, these negotiations proceeded, the tensions between the ethnic Germans living inside Poland, who used to be part of Germany, and the Poles uh, increased. Um, and to the point that these ethnic Germans began to be attacked viciously by Polish thugs with the encouragement of the, of the Polish government and also by Bolshevik Jews. 58,000 Germans were murdered? 58,000 Germans Man, were... that's just staggering. Yes, and Hitler was uh, at the point, uh, he said, I can't tolerate this anymore, and that as well as the refusal to negotiate over these other uh, requests for the reasons Pol uh, Germany invaded Poland. They had good cause to invade Poland. 
And uh, yet it was characterized in the Jewish propaganda, the worldwide Jewish propaganda, as another aggressive act by this madman who wanted to take over the world. Uh, here are uh, uh, German, Germans murdered by these Poles. Here's a daughter finding her mother dead. Uh, here you are. There's a woman with her husband dead just inside. Okay, so Hitler invades Russia, uh, Poland from the West on September 1st, 1933. And two days later, uh, Great Britain and France declare war on, on Germany. And, the, uh, and this, okay, this was a pretext. It wasn't a casus belli or a cause for war. They wanted a war and they were waiting for a pretext. And Hitler gave it to him when he invaded Poland. This had well, by slaughtering 58,000 Germans, they certainly created a reason for Hitler to be concerned did. Uh, about protecting, you know, uh, German people who happen to be in Poland who are being massacred. That's that's correct. Now, uh, what puts the lie totally to this is a is a reason for war is that uh, 17 days later, the Soviet Union invades Poland from the other side. And France and Great Britain did not declare war against the Soviet Union. In fact, later on, they became allies. So uh, uh, it was nonsense that this was this started World War III. It didn't. I think that's a very important point, that the Soviets also invaded Poland. Uh, this was uh, Stalin's gambit to what? Gain more territory to expand the Soviet Union? Well, he re yeah, he regained the part of uh, Poland that that uh, the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire had owned before war Poland was reconstituted as a state. So he just took that prop that, that territory back. But here, let me you know again, the Jews uh, portray themselves as uh, uh, innocent uh, victims, guiltless victims. When the Soviet army invaded. Poland. Now, Poland had the largest population of Jews uh, in the world at that time, two and a half million, uh, Soviet Union had 2.3 million. Uh, the Jews rushed out and welcomed these Russian troops coming into Poland as their liberators, if you will. And they did the same thing later on when Russia invaded uh, Lithuania and the, and the other Baltic states. The Jews rushed out to... So their attitude toward the German incursion was negative, but uh, toward the Russian was positive? That's right, exactly. Now, there's another little event uh, I would like to bring up that's kind of out of context, I guess. But anyway, I explained in, during the last session about the uh, Bolsheviks taking over the Russian state, of Jew, amounted to a Jewish coup d'etat of the Russian state. Something like we're talking 80, about, you're talking about the Bolshevik Revolution. Bolshevik Revolution back in 1917. Something like 80 to 85 percent of the uh, members of the Bolshevik government were Jews, and they created this Cheka. I forget it's an acronym standing for I forget what. But anyway, 75 percent of the members of the Cheka, and it grew to be a large organization with about 200. Well, wasn't it a secret uh, kind of a secret police? Yeah, a terror police, not quite so secret, but a terror police, the Cheka. Terror uh, police, later, yeah. later on became the NKVD and then the KGB. Yeah, uh, I don't think the history Americans get ever includes any discussion of the role of Jews in these events. I, that's exactly right. And I'm so sick of uh, hearing every day about the Holocaust, 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 when these people are not uh, innocent themselves. 75 no. Set of the check Listen, Ben, I've done a lot of work on the Holocaust. There were stories of six million Jews in dire straits or fear of loss of their lives, uh, 236 in the national press beginning in 1890, all before I, the Nuremberg Tribunals. I cover that in my book. I've got a chapter on it. Yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole Holocaust thing was a political theater. It's, a, it's an illusion, basically. It's a story to give a justification and motivation for the creation of Israel. It was a, it was a, a political propaganda, basically. Exactly. Now, this Cheka was agents were seventy five percent Jewish, and the other twenty five that were not Jewish were not Russian. There were a few Russians, only a handful. They were Georgians, uh, 
Lithuanians, uh, Poles, and so forth, and a real high percentage of these 25% who were not Jews significantly had Jewish wives. So it was a Jewish terror organization, and they launched this red terror against the Russian people, and they killed as many as 40 million before it was all over of Russian Christians. And so- wow, that's just dumbfounding. Yeah, and, we'll, and we hear about the Holocaust every day of our lives, but whoever writes about that Holocaust? Nobody. Right. right. Okay, fast forward then to the Soviets uh, invading uh, Poland, and they captured all these Polish officers and took them prisoner back inside Russia, just near the Polish border, and they killed them. 24,000 of them. The Germans found them later on at the Katyn Forest. Uh, uh, they... And who did, what was the point of that to decapitate the Polish military? It, it was a, a sort of the same motivation where they, back in after the Bolshevik Revolution, they wanted to kill the bourgeoisie, uh, the, the, that is anybody with leadership potential, and have nothing but proletarians and this peasants. This was a Czech-led massacre of the Polish army officers? Officers, that's right. And uh, they blamed it on the Germans. But anyway, who did it? The NKVD, which was a successor to the Cheka, still right. almost all Jewish agents, and they led these poor Polish officers down into this, against this wall, one by one, with their hands tied behind them, and shot them in the back of the head, one by one, with a 22 caliber pistol. And this was called wet work. And it went on for, a, how long does it take to kill 24,000 people one at a time with a bullet in the back of the head. This is unbelievably cruel and bloodthirsty. And who did it? The Jews. You never hear about these horrible uh, atrocities that the Jews were responsible responsible for. But so anyway, I wanted to point that out while we're if I uh, admit here. Yes, my knowledge of the history of this era is highly limited, so I'm very dependent on what you're presenting. And it seems to me you're a, a highly reliable source. And even though you're offering uh, a, an interpretation of history at variance with what we read in most history books, which appears to have been politically sanitized, I'm inclined to believe that you're giving a more accurate story than what we find elsewhere. So, Well, I, had I, I went out to Poland. I mentioned that last time and had this Polish history professor as my tour guide. Uh, right. I had just read a book uh, before I went out there, published by the uh, Book of the Month Club, and it was about this Katyn Forest uh, massacre. And this thick book, detail by detail by detail, attributed this massacre to the, to the Germans, to the Germans. And that's what we believed in this country at that time, anybody who knew anything about it at all. I went out and talked to my Polish history professor. I told him about the book. I said, what do you know about it? He said, I know everything about it. It wasn't the Germans who did it. It was the uh, Russians, the NKVD. And I said, you're going to be kidding. And no. Well, later on, after Perestroika and the archives opened up, they now admit that it was the Russians who did it. But they blamed it on the Germans for years. So anyway, that was uh, a little uh, life experience that I had. Okay, so here we're, uh, uh, Britain declares war against Germany, um, okay, and, and France. But it doesn't really go anywhere. They, they don't do anything. They, it's called a phony war for a while. It's about seven months long, starting in September of 1933, when they declared war on Germany. Nothing really happened except for a but, NATO. But if everyone knew that the Soviets had also uh, invaded Poland, wasn't it a question at the time why they weren't also declaring war on the Soviet Union? They just brushed it aside and didn't answer the question. Uh, and, and so obviously it, it, it invalidated their reasons because for Because the Russians, the Soviets weren't operating in such a way as to cleanse the, the influence of the Jews out of their government. They were in, essentially in control of it. The Jews, by this well, time- The other countries that were also affected by those who were promoting the interests of, of uh, the Zionists, uh, uh, of course, weren't interested in attacking the Soviet Union. That was already under their control. Exactly so. Uh, the NKVD was uh, mostly Jewish. The commissars, 
uh, they had a commissar in each military uh, office or command, and they were all Jews. Uh, and the purpose was to control the army. So anyway, uh, let's go on here. They, they had a phony war that where nothing happened really except for a naval war and the British Navy uh, and the French Navy, mainly the British Navy, imposed a total blockade against Germany. Now Germany's not doing anything to anybody here. After the Polish war settled down, took about a month and it was over, Hitler made a peace offer. Go, go to the next slide, Ben. Remember yeah. you're controlling the slides. Yeah. Uh, well, we haven't got to Norway yet, but he oh, made a peace offer. All right, all right, go right ahead. Yeah, he made a peace off offer to the British and, and the, uh, made, made two peace officers, and it was rejected out of hand. Okay, so uh, Churchill now comes back into the government. He's the warmonger of all warmongers. Uh, uh, he comes back into the government as a, First Lord of the Admiralty, the job he had back in World War I, and immediately he starts agitating for total war against, uh, against Germany. And so now, he, now, Churchill, as far as I understand, of course, was not Jewish. No, he was He was under the influence of many who were. He lived like a medieval count. He lived in a Huge house, like this television series, Upstairs, Downstairs, what's the one that just uh, ended? Uh, Down, Downton Abbey, that's how Churchill lived. And he didn't have any money. He uh, was a member of parliament, which paid almost nothing. He wrote books, but it didn't nearly pay for his lavish lifestyle. It turned out that he was a Gentile frontman, a spokesman and a writer for a this Jewish group called the Focus, which was funded lavishly by wealthy Jews in, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, Bernard Baruch even kicked in uh, some money back in America and, uh, for Churchill's lavish lifestyle. So he was actually a Gentile frontman for the very powerful Jews in Great Britain. Okay, so he becomes the first Lord of the Admiralty now. And the first thing he does, okay, now let me explain that Germany gets something like 60, 70% of her iron ore from Sweden, and it, get, and it comes in from the uh, port of Narvik in uh, Norway. So, um, and of course, iron ore is a principal constituent of steel when combined with carbon. So yeah. if, if they could cut off the access to iron ore, they could cut off German's capacity to manufacture steel and build all the most important forms of buildings, armaments, weapons, and so forth. The German economy was absolutely dependent on this source of iron. On steel. Uh, uh, yeah, on this source of iron ore that came out of the port of Norway. Uh, right. So Churchill, uh, and now anyway, after uh, 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 Britain and France declare war on Germany, immediately uh, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark declare their neutrality. And uh, Germany then uh, publicly declares, accepts their uh, declaration of neutrality with the exception that they wouldn't allow a third party country to, uh, to violate their neutrality, meaning Great Britain. But Churchill did it anyway. Uh, these uh, German ore ships were wending their way down inside uh, Norwegian waters and Danish waters into Germany, and uh, Churchill ordered that these ships be stopped and boarded, uh, and uh, their crews are arrested. And then this outraged the Germans. They were that was in violation of international law. What what Churchill? Yeah, what was the right of Britain to interfere with commerce between Norway and Germany? They didn't have one. So then Hitler ordered that. Norwegian waters be mined, so these German ships could not pass. He was cutting off the iron ore to- You said, uh, you said Hitler, you mean uh, Churchill. Mean Churchill, Churchill, sorry. Churchill. Yeah, so immediately, the very next day after Churchill ordered that, Germany invaded uh, Denmark and Norway. They had every right to do it. They had to protect their source of iron and iron ore and, and Great Britain had violated the neutrality of the Norway and Denmark. And of, course, and of course, England had already declared war on Germany because of Poland, even though they'd done nothing about it. 
Yes, that's right. So anyway, there was a, some naval skirmishes and when the, the British uh, sank a bunch of German ships, but the Germans landed troops in Norway and the British also landed troops in Norway. There were several kind of small battles, but the Germans won in every case. The British had to withdraw from Norway. And this was kind of a uh, disaster. So they had a big meeting in, um, in the British uh, cabinet and, and they kicked uh, uh, Chamberlain out and put Churchill in as the prime minister. And that was uh, probably the biggest mistake they could have made. Now, this is an, uh, irrelevant. This is uh, Dickon Quisling, who was the head of the National Socialist Party in Norway. Uh, he took over as the head of Norway, and he ordered the Norwegians not to resist the Germans. Now, of course, today, Quisling has come to mean someone who's a traitor in your country. But here, from what you're describing, it's not so obvious that he actually wasn't acting in the best interests of Norway. Yeah, he was. I mean, this was the propaganda side of the story, that he was quizzling becomes, uh, you know, a word for yeah, Getting the propaganda out of history is so damn difficult, Ben. That's why I'm fascinated by what you're telling me, because it offers an alternative interpretation that can serve as a corrective, understanding the amount of propaganda we've been given without assuming in a blanket way that everything you say is true, and that everything we've told is false, but it would seem that there's a whole lot that we haven't been informed of accurately for political reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the official story, <laughs> like Napoleon said, uh, history is a lie agreed upon. Uh, okay, so here we are. Uh, Churchill is now the prime minister, and he is just chomping at the bit for, for total war with Germany. So he sends in a big uh, uh, army into a, 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 something like two, 250,000 British soldiers into France, combined with the French army, about half a million soldiers, and they're preparing for an invasion of Germany. Now, Germany still had dust off their old Schlieffen plan and beats them to the punch. Now, uh, Germany in, in invades and he goes through Luxembourg and Belgium and, uh, and the Netherlands and into France. Uh, let's see if what the next slide looks like. And uh, surprises them by going through the Ardennes forest with a big uh, tank army. And anyway, to not go into too much detail, it defeats the French army. Was this a Rommel operation? And that's a, the Rommel operation. I don't understand why the British and the French thought the Ardennes Forest was impassable when it clearly was not. But he surprises them and takes a tank army and cuts, cuts their armies in two and defeats the British and he drives the, uh, defeats the French rather, and he drives the British army onto the beaches of Dunkirk. And here they are, vulnerable. You've got the German, German armies approaching, surrounding them, if they just kept going, they would destroy the British army or take them all prisoner, and the war would be over. So, But Hitler, on humanitarian grounds, stopped his army and allowed them to perform an evacuation? Exactly. And, and then he made this peace offer to Britain. He said, I don't want war with Britain. He, he expressed admiration for the British Empire. He wanted Germany and Britain to be have a friendly relationship. He even promised that uh, if Britain ever needed a German army to defend the British Empire, he would provide it. Churchill rejected it out of hand. The last thing Churchill wanted was peace. He wanted war. And so they- what, what do you think was driving that? Well, I think two things. He's a, he's, he's a, he's a warmonger. He'd loved war all his life, and he always dreamed about leading Germany, I mean, of Great Britain into a big war and, uh, in which they were victorious. That was his kind of uh, childish dream. He was a psychopath, classic psychopath. So was Roosevelt. Uh, what is a psychopath? A psychopath is a self-centered, uh, egotistical person who doesn't have any social fears and also doesn't have any empathy for other people. Uh, they're unmoved by massive suffering from other people and massive death caused by themselves. That's a psychopath. He was a classic. You know, when I look at uh, Dunkirk, Ben, I mean, this is truly fascinating. Hitler could have taken them all out effortlessly, effortlessly. These were defeated armies. And the, and the war would have been over. 
and and uh, he should have done it. I, I, I think, therefore, it was a strategic miscalculation by Hitler that he 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 was being overly compassionate. I mean, it's just the opposite yeah. of, the, of the diabolical caricature typically advanced of, of Adolf Hitler. This was the ultimate offer of friendship, and he got punched right in the eye over it. And uh, with a sharp stick. Here is the warmonger Churchill. Uh, now, I, I, I read an oh, article. He actually posed with a Tommy gun. This is not oh, a Photoshop. He, he's, he loves war. But he was also a representative of these powerful Jews who were pushing for war. They wanted to destroy Germany. So he, he had two reasons for wanting, wanting the war. I recently read an article about psychopaths by a psychology PhD on the internet. And he said that uh, psychopaths are drawn to political office like tall men are drawn to basketball. He said, if you look at a room full of uh, basket, professional basketball players, you're going to find a lot of tall men. If you look at a room full of politicians, you're going to find a lot of psychopaths. That's very interesting. <laughs> so it shouldn't be surprising. We that. only have time for one or two more slides before we have to take a break. So you pick it, Ben. Tell me when. Okay, let me just say that uh, when the very day that hit, uh, that uh, Churchill became the prime minister on May 10th, 1940, he ordered the bombing of the university town of Freiburg. Here's the picture of it. Why, why did he pick Freiburg? I mean, if it's a college town, what's the point of attacking Freiburg? Yeah, well, he and his uh, guy Lindemann, who Lord Sherwell, who was his advisor, he was Jewish, by the way, came up with this Lindemann plan, uh, where they wanted to they they wanted to attack civilians, not military targets, and the that's whole an act, that's an act of terrorism. That's exactly right, and there was no reason there was no military uh, value. This town yeah, value. It was strictly a terrorist act. And that's he, outrageous, you know. We don't. He, we tend to regard Churchill as a saintly figure, but here he is committing an act of terrorism on the German people. Exactly, and he started to bomb German cities relentlessly for three months before Hitler finally retaliated and bombed London. And uh, so it was the British throughout who were the provocateurs. Okay. And not, After and not, Dunkirk, you would have thought they would have been appreciative that this man is not maybe not the monster they were portraying him as being. Well, they wanted him to be a monster. They they cooked the books to make sure that people thought of them. They had they had ulterior motives. They were lying, and they knew whether they were lying. Man, at this point, we'll take a break. Jim Fair host on the Real Deal with my very special guest uh, studying the history of World War II. Benton Bradbury will be right back less than three percent of you people read books because less than 15 percent of you read newspapers right now there is a whole an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube this tube can make or break presidents popes prime ministers television is not the truth Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We deal in illusions, man. None of it is true. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. Broadcasting live on Network Radio. So turn off your television set, turn them off now, turn them off and leave them off. say with moral certainty and considerable scientific authority that the death of JFK was committed by a meticulously executed conspiracy which was obscured by an extensive cover-up. Cover -up. 
Murder in Dealey Plaza, edited by James Fetzer, goes to the heart of the JFK assassination. You'll read new and up-to-date information regarding the Secret Service, the Lincoln limousine, the medical evidence, the cover-up, altering the film, framing the patsy, and the silent historians. Also, 16 smoking guns, each one crushing the government's lone assassin scenario. A world-class chronology of November 22nd, 1963. Chapters by David W. Mantic, Gary Aguilar, Vincent Palomara, Douglas Weldon, Jack White, Ira David Wood III, James H. Fetzer, Doug Horn, and a classic essay by Bertrand Russell. The complete story in the pages of one single book, edited by James H. Fetzer. Read it now. Read it again. You'll use it as a reference. Murder in Dealey Plaza. Available at Amazon.com and major bookstores around the world. It's murder. This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade. It looks like one of those scenes of an old building being purposely dynamited and blown. When we are successful. I'm just, just a patsy. And we will be. We're ready to make, uh, to come to the microphone, so we'll listen up. A new world order. <sighs> so my name's Robbie Parker. It might have appeared that way, but from my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Live from the Media Broadcasting Center. 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 This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, continuing... My conversation with Benton Bradbury, the author of The Myth of German Villainy, which is available at Amazon.com and through other uh, book outlets. Uh, I am absolutely fascinated by uh, Benton's take and interpretation, which is completely different than what we read in the standard history books, and where I believe that there's more truth than what Benton is. what Benton 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 what Okay, now the, uh, after Dunkirk, Hitler uh, makes peace offers to, to Churchill. Churchill rejects it. He doesn't want peace. Uh, he makes numerous peace off, offers, uh, as a matter of fact, and they're rejected. But uh, so the Battle of Britain begins, uh, begins and uh, Hitler really doesn't have his heart in that. He doesn't want to have a war with, uh, with uh, Great Britain, and he puts... Um, um, Who's his, who's his air marshal, uh, Garing, in charge of the Battle of Britain, and, and he kind of washes his hands of it personally. So th this goes on and not very successful. Uh, Can success we be on the slide 120 instead of where we are? Or? Yeah, uh, okay. And then we've got uh, Ger yeah. uh, Britain relentlessly uh, bombing uh, Germany. Now, this guy is Professor uh, Frederick Lindemann. He's Jewish. He was born in Baden-Baden and -Baden Germany and uh, immigrated to England. He went back to Germany and got his PhD in physics and he became a uh, innovate, innovator in aviation development and so forth. And he wanted to kill as many civilians as possible? Exactly. Uh, That's completely disgusting. This man ought to be strung up by his neck until dead. Another psychopath, he was Jewish and he had a pathological hatred, not just for Hitler and the Nazis, but for the German people. And uh, Churchill appointed him to the, his advisor, the government advisor on, on uh, the, the air war. And so he came up with the Lindemann plan. What I was mean, the Lindemann? Bombing civilian targets is a classic terrorist activity. I mean, it's a disgrace. This is absolutely shocking. And that Churchill should have adopted it? Yeah, well, Churchill was enthusiastic about it, just as much as this guy was, and other powerful Jews in Britain 
as well as Morgenthau in America and Harry Dexter White and all of them were enthusiastic about this plan. But the plan- in relation to the Geneva Conventions of 1949, all this carpet bombing. No, to 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 total violation. Punishment, yeah. punishment. Yeah. that's a war crime, Ben. These are war crimes we're talking about. Well, the victors uh, decide who's a war criminal. In this case, uh, they made a hero out of this guy. But what, but what was the Lindemann plan? The Lindemann plan said, forget about military targets. They built these huge uh, fleets of uh, four-engine uh, bombers. Here, here we have, I think, a Lancaster, the Lancasters dropping bombs. But um, they, the Germans never built these heavy bombers. The Germans built tactical bombers that, that supported their army on the field. They never uh, developed anything to attack civilians, and it was always uh, against German policy to attack civilians. But this guy says, no, let's forget about military targets. Let's concentrate on German housing. And now what was supposed to be the rationale? How did he convince Hitler of this? I mean, Churchill, said, who might we, be more appropriately described as Hitler. How did he describe Churchill to induce Hitler, uh, Churchill to adopt this monstrous plan? Well, he was enth as enthusiastic about it as uh, Lindemann was. The idea was to kill as many German civilians as possible, destroy their housing, uh, and, the, and the, their idea, their belief, that they, they claimed, they believed it, I don't know if they did, was that this would destroy the morale of the German people, and the German people would then demand unconditional surrender. Of course, uh, that's, that's not, that precisely the opposite was true of the British, when the Germans were bombing the British, I mean, their, their resistance grew with the drop. Stiffened their backbone, that's right. And so this was just a, this was a genocidal plan. And yeah. they, they yeah. sent the fleets of bombers, a thousand of these things at a time, and dropped these bombs on German cities. Here is a, a Cologne. I was in Cologne a few years ago. That's completely rebuilt now, but this yes, managed to survive, but look all around it. Everything else destroyed. I, 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 when I was 15, I went on a bicycle tour. This is 1956 of England, Belgium, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and France, including Cologne. And the city was very much rebuilt at that point in time already. Yeah. But look at look at this. This is what they did. Now here, they developed this, uh, this, this uh, system of bombing. They, and they the first time they used it, uh, completely was in bombing Hamburg. I think they bombed Hamburg for 10 days straight to destroy the entire city. They would send a thousand bombers over the city loaded with high explosive, big, huge blockbuster bombs and drop them on the buildings to blow the roofs off. About three hours later, they had this all timed just for psychological reasons. The people would be coming out of their shelters and all that. They sent another thousand bombers over and dropped incendiaries. And this was to start a firestorm. And, uh, and the firestorm was so horrendous, the first huge firestorm is in Hamburg, that it sucked three foot diameter trees out of the ground mile, a couple of miles away and sucked them into the inferno, sucked roofs off of houses into this and people by the thousands just flying in the air into this inferno. And the, uh, they worked these this. Are the, these are the kinds of atrocities of which Hitler is accused, Ben. It seems that the, the finger ought to be pointing in the opposite direction. Exactly right. They did this deliberately. They planned this, uh, these stages of dropping these bombs. And then they followed that up with uh, uh, loads of uh, anti personnel bombs to maximize the kill rate. Oh, it's and terrible. Unbelievable. Terrible, absolutely terrible. Uh, they bombed about a thousand German cities and towns, and they completely destroyed the about 160 of the largest cities and towns in Germany. This is a picture of uh, Dresden. I was in Dresden also. They completely rebuilt that. Uh, they tried to minimize, I guess out of political correctness today, the number of uh, German civilians killed in this bombing. They claim about 750,000, which is totally absurd. Probably as many as five to 600,000 were killed in the bombing of Dresden alone. Sure, oh, this had to add up to millions of people. Yeah, and here are uh, children without parents. 
lost in the midst of the rubble. These, mind you, the German people and the German culture is almost the same as our own, almost the same as that of Britain. These are people that you could see in the supermarkets and the shopping centers here in this country and our Miss Americas and so forth. Sure. These people we are slaughtering because we've so demonized them that we think that they deserve death. That's cathedral. And we, we have done this again and again in the Middle East, for example, with Saddam Hussein, with Muammar Gaddafi, and now with Bashir Assad. It's all obscene, completely obscene, Ben. It is. These are pictures. I'll just cycle through, and that's Cologne again. Yeah. Uh, I, it's a miracle, a miracle that Germany was able to rebuild these cities after the war. Yeah, we yeah, were, yeah, absolutely stunning. We were riding a train into Frankfurt, Germany, a few years ago when I was there, my wife and I. And um, we, we were approaching Frankfurt, and there was this mountain there. And I said, wait a minute, there's no mountain here. This is a flat plain, Germany is. And as we drew closer, that mountain was rubble from the city. Oh, my and, God. And they had bulldozers still. They had columns and cornices and all kinds of things from what once were palaces and beautiful buildings that were now a pile of rubble. Uh, here you are. Wow. Uh, OK, these were the victims, old men, women, and children. This is what the Lindemann plan was after, to kill these people. Here, here. Brutal. Brutal. Family. Uh, yeah, here's a woman. Yeah. This is in Dresden. They had so many dead in Dresden, possibly as many as five to 600,000. Uh, uh, now, the estimate, they're trying to reduce it now down to 25,000. Ridiculous. Like absurd. absurd, yes. Uh, they had to, it took months to, piled all these people up and, and burned the bodies to, to get rid of them. This is a picture after a bombing, another. This is inhuman. This is a hospital that was bombed. There's a person burned to death. Son, father and his son. Look at this woman. This is, uh, these people, these are children that were, it looks like they probably suffocated in a cellar or something. Let's dress it again. Here's a hangar in Berlin after a bombing. These people all look like they are uninjured, so they probably suffocated in cellars. Here's a woman looking at a pile of dead uh, school children. These are some of the survivors after their parents killed, they're sitting there by themselves, no place to go, Oops. they began to starve to death. Look at this. Baby killed, here's a woman in despair. Bombed out and nowhere to go. Okay, now that takes us through the bombing. What were, what was, what were they after? They, they were determined to destroy Germany. And they destroyed Germany city by city by city, and they were determined to kill as many Germans as possible. Now, when the Germans began to uh, lose the war, I guess Stalingrad was the turning point and, uh, in, in Russia. The, the war, by the way, the ground war was really fought between Germany and the Russians, not between Germany and Britain and America. Uh, Britain and America um, did a bombing the, a war. That's 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 what we did. Oh, and yeah, well, good. And the, the bombing in Dresden was the. What's the point of raping the women before killing them? They were encouraged to 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 take them as their booty. You know, there is, uh, and uh, he this guy was the um, propaganda minister, what's his name, Ehrenberg. He's Jewish and he's the Russian propaganda minister. And when the Russian army began to go into, push into Germany, uh, he had leaflets drawn up that encouraged 
the German, the Russian army to kill all Germans, men, women, and children, kill everybody, rape the women first and then kill them, he said, and just put out these flyers and have these people so inflamed that that's what they did. The first, uh, let's see, I guess, uh, they, the first place that, that they, the German, the Russians went into was uh, uh, Niemersdorf in East Prussia, and uh, the Prussian people, now they were fairly uh, isolated during the war. They weren't bombed very much in East Prussia, not uh, as much as the rest of it. And they, it was mainly an agricultural area and they were fairly innocent and didn't really naive about the horrors of the war. And then, then come the Russian soldiers into Niemersdorf, the first town in East Prussia they came into. They killed every living person, man, woman, child, and child. They nailed women still alive uh, to barn doors, uh, crucifixion style. They were so shocked that this set off, uh, when, when they pushed them back out, by the way, the, the, the Germans did, and went, went in, and they were so shocked at what the Russians did that this set off a, a, a terror evacuation in East Prussia, and the people all picked up in columns and tried to get out of East Prussia before the German for the Russians. Russians. Yeah. Uh, this is pictures of Niemersdorf. They killed everybody in the most horrible ways you can imagine. Chop their legs off. Okay. This is this is another horror tale that that occurred um, as a result of this. Uh, Jewish propaganda minister Ehrenberg encouraging these people to commit atrocious acts against the Germans. These girls are in the uh, German labor, labor service. They were secretaries, typists, and so forth. They did all kinds of work. That's, what, that's the picture of a group of them. Um, when the Russian uh, army came into uh, Vilmc in Neustetten, they rounded up 500 of these girls. Now this, this story was written by a, um, a woman who was in the labor service. She was a German citizen, but she had immigrated from Brazil. I can't remember her name, but she wrote uh, about it. And she was an eyewitness because she was Brazilian and uh, an ally of uh, Russia. She was treated differently. She was separated out. They found her. So she was she, spared. She was spared. She, yeah. Right, and she witnessed all this. But they took these girls a group at a time into this big hall, this room where these Polish and Russian soldiers were. They stripped them naked. They cut their breasts off. They cut their ears off, their noses off. They threw them down on the floor. They rammed sharp objects up their vaginas. They cut their bellies open. And all the time, the other soldiers that were surrounding were just screaming and cheering. And they brought way, group after group after group of these terrified, screaming young girls. This is they, just nauseating, man. Nauseating. Yeah. Look at these girls. They could be in your high school here in America. Um, OK. And talk about acts of terror. I mean, this is as, as uh, human butchery. This is as, as brutal, as savage as it gets, Ben. Inhuman, inhuman. Uh, anyway, the, I, don't, most, I don't know if people, I don't think they know about the story of the rape of German women, but perhaps no. millions of German women were raped at, uh, when the Russian army came into uh, Germany. And this is a, uh, I saw this movie, by the way, this is a, picture from the movie A Woman in Berlin. I read the book also. And it's about the Germans coming into Berlin and raping every woman they can get their hands on. And was that supposed to be a weapon of war then? Rape as a weapon of war? I think so. They were encouraged to do it. Now, at least the Allies, when we came in from the other side, there was a lot of raping going on there too, but it, at least it wasn't encouraged. But the Russian propaganda encouraged these Russians 
could take any woman you want. And these women from eight years old to 80 years old were uh, mass raped 40 or 50 times a day by these. Uh, I, I had a personal experience. Do we have time? I'll tell it. I, I knew some, we were in the real estate business once years ago, and I, I, it was a beautiful German woman, a very elegant lady who was a real estate agent. And she was about 65 or so. This was several many years ago. And she had been, lived through in Germany through the war. And so I was asked her, I've been reading a lot about it, and I asked her about it. She said, you want to know the real story? And so she sat down in my office. She said, I'll tell you the story. She said, my sister and I were teenage girls. And we were taken prisoner by these Russians who came into the South. I think she was in Berlin. And she said, we were raped numerous times a day for a week on top of the building. They were kept up there prisoner until finally a Russian officer came in and saw what was going on. And he screamed at the Russian soldiers and he took the girls and he let them go. And that was a personal thing that I heard about, but uh, I, I've read about this. And Ben, Ben, they were the lucky ones. The lucky ones, yeah. They were the lucky ones. They were only raped repeatedly and brutally for a week. Okay, but we weren't so innocent ourselves, the Americans, when we came into uh, Germany. I mean, the occupation of Germany. Here, I'll, I'll throw out a number. I read that 8 million Germans died during the war. But 13 million Germans died after the war was over as a result of the war. And because here, of our treatment of the Germans as captives after the war. By everybody. 15 million Germans were pushed out of their ancestral homes in Eastern Europe, Hungary, Silesia, Poland, even Russia, and forced back into Germany, which couldn't take them in. Germany was starving and had no housing for them. But they were pushed in. Two and a half million of these people died on the way. Incredible. Eisenhower, we think of him as a great man, as a benevolent man, and so forth. But uh, I read the book by James Bakke, Other Losses. And he says that uh, five and a half million German soldiers were taken prisoner by Eisenhower, by the American army, after the war. Now, General Patton disagreed with this. He said, let these men go home to their families. The war's over. Eisenhower wanted vengeance. And so the Geneva Convention had rules protecting prisoners of war, so he changed their designation from prisoners of war to disarmed combatants. Just a little uh, Furby uh, trick to... Uh, to That's enable. so corrupt, man. Yeah. That is so, so corrupt. I would have thought that was completely beneath Eisenhower. This is shocking to me. Yeah, it, sh it was shocking to me when I learned it. But he had these people rounded up and put in camps along the Rhine River in these open pastures with just barbed wire around them and, and uh, uh, watchtowers with people with machine guns controlling them. And five and a half million of them, and you see this picture, they had no shelter. It, it was still cold, freezing. It doesn't even appear they have any facilities, any sanitation facilities. Get this. He ordered that they not be given any food or water for six days. Why six days? Because after six days, you die. So he took it right up to the point of death before he gave them any water. He wanted to punish these Germans. And, and of course, they would die anyway. I mean, after that point, your body's so depleted that you can't survive even if you're given food. So according to James Bakke in his book, a million and a half of these captive soldiers, they were kept captive for no reason, no reason. The war was over. I mean, it made every sense to, to send these people back home to their families, which is what General Patton wanted to do. He refused to cooperate in this program. Uh, of uh, punishing these German soldiers. And that's why he was fired from his job as the, the over Bavaria. He was the- it may, it may be why his uh, perhaps non-accidental death came to pass. Yeah, I read a, a book by a guy named Bazot, I think, and he claims that he shot Patton with a, some kind of a bullet that was made out of stone or something. And uh, 
didn't kill him, but he went to the hospital where Jewish doctors, uh, Biddy Man was the, so the story went. So he was clearly uh, murdered. The story yes. was he was supposed to be, oh, I guess it was a, a cart that just missed him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's something to what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, I did an interview um, with a, a, a woman whose husband had been Pat and Zane. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Okay, here's another picture of, uh, of the German prisoners uh, exposed out in the open. They got no medical care. Here they are. They dig holes in the ground for shelter. They got no medical care. Half the time, they didn't have water, although they were right there by the Rhine River. They, we had mountains of food, and we put them on a 300-calorie-a-day diet. Uh, we not only did that, we starved the German people. Um, okay, what is this? This is uh, about the 50, I've mentioned that 15 million uh, Germans were pushed out of East Europe into Germany, which was not uh, prepared to accommodate them, and two and a half million. Was this historically out of sequence, then? Uh, it is, yeah. I, I already mentioned that. That's out of chronological sequence, yeah. Okay, they, these are pictures of these people, these Germans, uh, 15 million of them who were pushed out. Here they are on the road. Uh, they die on the road from starvation, from exposure, from brutality, murder, rape, everything imaginable. Here they are. This is unbelievable that these people have to pick up from the homes they've lived in for generations and have to walk into Germany under these conditions. Yeah, and the United States went along with this. We agreed to that at the, uh, okay. And here, look at these children. They could be in grade school. Wait, 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 what year was all this taking place, Ben? 1945. Oh, really? So this is in fact after the war? After the war, after the war, it's over. 1945. Well, this is in chronological sequence then. Yeah, that's right. It happens after the war is over. And then we come to the Nuremberg trials. Uh, now, let's see, do I have a, okay, let me just uh, talk about a couple of things here. Um, we had in, in Maryland, um, and near the end of the war, we had this Camp Ritchie. Have you ever heard of Camp Ritchie, uh, the Ritchie boys? I think I have. Yeah, okay, they had 9,000 uh, Jewish young, youngish men that had immigrated from Germany to the United States after the National Socialists took over. That was part of Hitler's pushing them out. They, they weren't injured. They, nothing happened to them. And anyway, they were taken into the army uh, and sent to Camp Ritchie, where they were, underwent a training on psychological warfare, how to interrogate prisoners. Uh, and they were instructed all, all the methods of torture. Now, mind you, these Jewish men were uh, subjected to the propaganda, the, the hate propaganda against the Germans, all the uh, hysterical uh, talk about the persecute, the extermination of Jews in the camps and all this kind of stuff. Most of it was nonsense, pure lies. But these people were so conditioned to hate Germans. They couldn't wait to get into Germany. Now, we, we, we took them in after the war was over to interrogate German soldiers and officers and so forth. They couldn't wait to get in there to exact uh, revenge against these Germans. So the Nuremberg trials were uh, held. And of the th uh, 3,000 people who worked in the Nuremberg trials, 2,400 of them were Jews. Did you know that? This was a Jewish vengeance trial. These Ritchie boys came in, and, and uh, there were lots of uh, these Germans, uh, uh, Jews, uh, in, uh, they were all in American Army uniforms. And they came in, and they interrogated all these people. They interrogated uh, soldiers. They beat the hell out of them. They knocked their teeth out. They knocked their eyes out. They. Uh, shocked them with 120-volt uh, shots, almost killed them. They did kill numerous of them. They crushed their testicles. Something like 
a very high percentage, a majority of these uh, Germans, Germans who had been interrogated in these jails and prisons by these Richie boys and, and these Jews had their testicles crushed. And they... Yeah, I'm wrote, just hearing about it. They wrote out confessions and required these people to sign them. And if they didn't sign them, they started the torture over again. And they signed anything and put it in front of them. And that's how most of the information uh, came from the Germans for the Nuremberg trials, came from, these, from torture. There's some excellent work on this by Robert Forasson. Uh, one article is entitled uh, Against Re Revisionism, Hollywoodism, where he talks about the contrivance of the Nuremberg tribunals to deflect guilt off of the allies for bombing the German cities by having this contrived event and how they brought in a professional Hollywood director to do selective filming to make it look as though the labor camps were actually centers for execution and where they mixed together, you know, findings from different areas, locations where you'd have a British officer working a bulldozer to put bodies into a big pit from the Russian front and present it as though it were something that had happened at Dachau or Auschwitz. Well, uh, here's, a, here's the next minute. When the Americans came in and, and went into these camps, okay, we, we were, had re been relentlessly bombing German cities. And they, in the last months of uh, the war, Briti British and American fighter planes, 1,800 British and American fighter planes were given the job of flying over Germany. They were totally defenseless at this point, totally defenseless and destroying their tr transportation. Uh, these, the skies over Germany were filled with these American and British fighter planes who shot up refugee trains. They first fly in and shoot the uh, steam engine and blow it up, and then make passes back and forth, shooting up the train loads of refugees. They shot cars on the, on the, on the roads. They shot people riding bicycles on the roads. The, the, these fighter planes, people walking on the roads. They shot farmers plowing in their fields, shot their livestock. They shot through windows of houses. For, for two or three months, they completely stopped the movement of anything in Germany uh, for the last several months, of a few months of the war. The German people couldn't even feed their own people. And the inmates in these concentration camps uh, they couldn't get food uh, to them, and they began to, uh, because of the weakened bodies from from starvation, began to typh typhus epidemics began to break out, and that's what the Americans saw when they came in, and they said that the Germans did this deliberately. They did not. They did their best to try to care for these people, but they simply lost control because of this Germ uh, uh, American Allied bombing and strafing that had occurred in the last months of the war. So the, these were inmates in these concentration camps, and, but they, were, they had died not because of a deliberate policy to kill them or starve them. They died because they couldn't feed them because of the American bombing and strafing, American and British bombing and strafing. So that explains that. Now, this guy here, Robert Wood, is a Jew, Sergeant John, John, John C. Wood, so I'm sorry. He's the hangman that hanged all the people that were sentenced to death in the Nuremberg trials. Um, now, here's, here's an interesting little item. The Jewish control of the Nuremberg trials was blatant. It was a blatantly a vengeance uh, effort. They, it, they, they, the accusers were also the uh, prosecutors and, and the judges. How fair is that? Uh, they, they were show trials. They already had decided that these Germans were going to be executed. And all they did was uh, to put a legal gloss over doing it. Now, Purim Day. I had never heard of it before until I, I read about it. Uh, I, but it's a Jewish holiday. In the book of Esther, so I've read, the Ten Sons of Haman, which uh, an enemy of the Jews were hanged on Purim Day, a Jewish holiday. On Purim Day in 1946, 
10 German leaders were hanged by this man, Robert, I mean, John Wood. This could not have been a coincidence. This is how blatant this Jewish vengeance was uh, using the Nuremberg trials. To oh, yeah. I mean, these things are not coincidental at all. In fact, uh, there, there's a, a very, uh, uh, there's a, uh, something called geometrica. I think that Chance, my producer, could comment on it about a, a Jewish calendar, the significance of Jewish number of numbers and Jewish theology and all this. It's really uh, stunning stuff. And none of this is by accident or coincidental, Ben. Yeah, after, after the war, the Jews flooded back into Germany to exact revenge and get their share of the spoils and so forth. But as the American army was pushing the German army out of Italy back into Germany, a uh, group of, of um, called the Jewish Brigade. You ever heard of the Jewish Brigade? Uh, they were formed in Palestine. And they were, the enlisted men in the Jewish Brigade were, were German Jews who had immigrated from Germany to Palestine. Now they were in the Jewish Brigade. The officers and the NCOs were Jews in the British Army. They were all outfitted in British uniforms, and they had uh, helmets with a white band around it and a white armband, and they drove American jeeps, and they were official, uh, had official status, and they followed the American Army into Germany to exact revenge against uh, the Germans. So after they got into Germany and the war was over, the German said gone as many of them could, went home to their families. The others were in the prison camps that we talked about already. This uh, Jewish brigade, I wrote two, read two books about it, both written by Jews, by the way. I can't remember the name. One of them was the Jewish brigade, and I forget, forget the other where they describe what they did. They divided up into what they call vengeance squads. And they had, uh, they were lavishly supported by the British Army and they had American jeeps and they had official status as a kind of a police. And they could go into the German files, had access, they read German, and they would find the home addresses of senior German officers who'd gone home after the war was over. They would, uh, three or four of them, it would go out in an American Jeep and, uh, and knock the door down and find this German um, uh, general and would abduct him, take him out, and shoot him in the head. Oh, God. They killed at least, according to the guy who wrote the book, he was Jewish himself, they, shot, they killed at least 1,500 German senior officers who had already... this, is, this is just such a disgrace this is such a stain on the history of the united states and its character uh, and this yet, is completely appalling and yet they present themselves as the this innocent race of people who are constantly throughout their history oppressed or exterminated and so on for no reason whatsoever except that they happen to be jews and everybody's jealous of them nonsense when they get control over people they don't like, they are the most brutal. I've people. seen allusions to the Jews being excluded from some 136 different countries because of their practices, uh, predatory practices. I mean, I hate to say these things, but there seems to be an awful lot of substantiation for it. Yeah, the expulsion of the Jews out of uh, National Socialist Germany was just the, one of the latest events. They've been expelled numerous times before because they are parasitic and they exploit the host populations. And the people get tired of it and turn against them. And then, I mean, how is it possible that in every country that Jews have lived in, the people have turned against them eventually and kicked them out of their country? Uh, can it be anybody's fault except the Jews themselves? No. So anyway, the, the, the war is over. And uh, I, in the last chapter of my book, I talk about who the winners were and who the losers were. And uh, I say that uh, Great Britain was listed in the winner category, but they were not. Uh, all Churchill managed to do in, in taking Britain to war against Germany was to bankrupt the country and, and collapse the British Empire, make uh, 
little England, uh, an insignificant little country again. Um, who were the winners? The winners, uh, obviously, were the Soviet Union and the United States. We kind of divided up Europe as uh, vassal states to the United States, and then uh, the Soviet Union controlled Eastern Europe, and then the Cold War began. After the Cold War began, we treated the Germans horribly, horribly. I mean, uh, starved them to death until this Cold War began. And then all of a sudden, the Germans were the good guys and an integral part of the Western Christian civilization again. Uh, you know, that started back, what, about? Ben, ben, you've months. done a wonderful job here. And I want to recommend your book, The Myth of German Villainy to Everyone. And, and because even tonight we were under cyber attack, I want to take advantage of the fact that we're, you, you, you've completed your presentation, have you not? Yeah, I, I wanted to say that uh, the, the real winners of the war were international Jewry, even though they call, they, the official story is, the Holocaust and all that, is that they were the primary victims of the war. But look, what, look where the Jews are today. Uh, as a result of the war. They uh, have they, about 6 million Jews in Israel and about 6 million Jews in America uh, control this country and divert massive amounts of American dollars into Israel uh, against you know, the American Susan, people. Susan Rice, the national security advisor to Barack Obama, has declared that Israel is going to get the largest foreign aid package ever in history from the United States, even though since they have undeclared stockpiles of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, according to our own United States foreign policy guidelines, they are not entitled to receive any foreign aid because of those undeclared stockpiles of weapons. It, it, the, the hypocrisy is so blatant, Benton. It, 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 I mean, your program, what you have presented to me is totally nauseating and represent the ultimate hypocrisy of the United States and the Allies in these encounters. And the fact that Germany suffered unbelievably uh, uh, because of it, it, its own efforts to uh, preserve the integrity and the well-being of the German people. To me, it's an absolutely shocking, devastating what you presented. And the and fact now, that, now, well, now that they control everything, they control this country even to an equally great extent as they controlled Weimar Germany. You can go to on the internet right now and say, who controls America? And there's a program on there. Somebody's done a fantastic job. You can uh, select any department in the government, any institution in America, and who runs it. And they've got pictures and the names of the people who run it, and they're Ashkenazi Jews. They control everything. They have totally displaced the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, that is the old WASP elite that used to run this country, they're gone. They are powerless now. And the Jews run everything today. Uh, look at our uh, university. Look at the Ivy League universities. Six of the eight presidents of Ivy League universities are Jewish. Right now, we've got eight Supreme Court justices. Four of them are Jewish. No, uh, no, no, no. On the court, we've had, uh, uh, before Scalia died, we had six Catholics and three Jews. Well, uh, and now it's totally it, it, dead. We have five Catholics and three. Sotomayor is a Sotomayor is a uh, her her background is Jewish. I understand. I could be wrong. Some people list her as a Jew. But but, but Benton, look, you've done a wonderful, wonderful job. I need to use the opportunity of the time we have remained to have a conversation with Chance about the way we're being attacked and what we might be able to do about it, because yeah. even this program was under attack, and after fifteen minutes. Uh, our viewers, when are unable to watch it, they're only going to be able to see it when it's rebroadcast. So, you know, th this has been a constant problem, and Chance and I need to discuss it. But I can't thank you enough for your really powerful presentation. I think your research is staggering in its implications and re revealing of how the history really is a pack of lies the living play upon the dead. Okay. So... I guess that wraps it up then. Uh, thank That's you very perfect. much. Yeah. I'm going to talk with Chance about our situation with regard to broadcasting. But I want to thank you, Benton. You've done a wonderful, wonderful job. Okay. Good night. Super.
I'll send you the link, by the way, as soon as the show's up in the air. Okay, thanks, Jim. You got it. Chance, you want to bring you in? And, yeah. Are you there? Yep, yep, I'm here, Jim. Okay, I want you to tell our audience some of the experiences we have had where you have come home from work only to discover that everything had been wiped, that all your files were done, that you had to reset up everything. I, th I think the people who who follow this program need to understand the situation we're in. I, I, I think it's completely stunning and indefensible and indicates, you know, that, that the government is simply out to suppress every avenue, every technique it can use to keep the truth about any of these issues from getting out. Now, now to start off, um, uh, back before we had Jim Fetzer on NBC, we did have some technical issues, but it was more of a learning curve, trying to figure out how to broadcast, how to get uh, a video show to work. So we were able to work out a lot of that over the, the couple of years leading up to Jim. And then once you uh, once you got on to, to this network, we started experiencing like in real time, active of outside kind of interference where like you said, I would I would have an entire show ready to go. We, we we would be in a conversation, and then we'd get ready to say, "Okay, we're almost ready to go on air," and my entire board would get wiped clean. Everything that was preloaded, everything on my on my computer is gone. Or we we would have a, a perfect conversation leading up to the show. We'd go on to the air, and and the conversation gets cut. Or um, if we were using Skype, it would be completely interrupted. But even using this uh, video conference that we're using now, that's that's a uh, kind of like a small encryption. It it basically gets cut off too. And and, and uh, some of the shows you have with Dennis Camino and and a couple of the other very controversial guests, it's it's more actively in real time, active blocking. I've had thousands of of, of gigs of of information wiped off the computer. Uh, computers just stop working. Um, literally had to get in and new people in here in to do uh, uh, more internet cables and everything. Like it's just every possible scenario that you could think of that just doesn't happen by coincidence all started happening when we got Jim on here and he started talking about controversial things. I mean, of course, those are the only ones worth talking about. I mean, after all, if it isn't controversial, why bother? And if it's uh, simple rather than complex, everyone understands what's going on anyway. So I'm dealing with complex and controversial issues. And I have been so grateful to you, Chance, since you invited me to come aboard, because the opportunity to present evidence visually. I mean, look at our program tonight. It, it, we have nearly 200 photographs, 189 by actual count. And they were just devastating. They were so informative. They were so powerful. Now, just imagine without the photographs how much you would have understood and appreciated of what uh, Benson Bradbury had to say about the myth of German villainy without the photographs versus with them. I think with the video, anyone who knows Jim personally could have saw just how mad you were getting as he was presenting this. I thought you were just getting enraged from the video. And if you, like you said, if you were on radio, no one would even know. Now, the, the, the only thing I've been able to do recently, because it's been getting hit harder and harder the last month or two, to be able to kind of compensate is when we do broadcast on YouTube, it's in low res, low quality, just to kind of be able to get it out. And normally what I do is upload everything afterwards because we record in-house. So I've been kind of fighting with it to the point where you know, where I'm almost losing some of my production because I'm, I'm trying to just keep the stream going. In the last couple of weeks, I've just decided to kind of, once it cuts out, just almost give up on the on the live feed, keep the in-house recording going, and then put the archive up because 99% of the time, the majority of the viewers is all on an archive basis. You'll get like, you know, 1% to 2% of the people live show compared to your archive. So it's kind of more important to keep the information keep the show quality going, kind of not interfere with the live show as much as we can. It's when they shut the whole show down or, or my entire internet goes down or just things that are, that if it happened once or twice, I'd say, you know, ah, maybe it's just crappy equipment or, or maybe that's happening, but it's just a consistent attack, literally. What can we, what can we do to deal with it, Chance? How can we help to get the show on the air? Well, would it, it, would it, 
Can, can we can we contribute to getting you some kind of equipment that would enable you to cope better with this? Well, a lot of the people on the in the chat room, I, I'm telling you, Jimmy, you got the smartest chat room people. They all just kept saying they, week after week, you know, is there any way we could help out? Uh, you should start a GoFundMe, something like that. And and I upgraded to a, like a, a lot better computer than I've never been using. But you know, if if this is something that is is you know quite possibly going to be able to to fix the problem or at least be able to to handle it a lot better than uh, what I'll do is before next week, over the weekend, I'll, I'll set up a little GoFundMe and maybe at the beginning and, and end of every show, just kind of remind people and we'll have a page set up that's easy to find. And uh, Good. maybe just, you know, another, uh, another brain in here. And, and at the same time, I, I've mentioned this to, uh, to Angel to, 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 to throw it on his show. Uh, any who, anybody who's like a techie, someone who really knows what they're doing, you know, we would love the help and, and anything is, is totally appreciated. You can get a hold of me directly at George at we book your show.com. That's George at we book your show.com. And uh, if, if you could help me, cause like I said, I've been, I've been doing a lot of learning curve on my own, but uh, we, we appreciate any help that we get someone who maybe knows uh, how to, how to stop some of this. Well, I think that's an excellent chance to, you know, at, at least let let our audience know what we're up to get. 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 Such as sending sending payments for those who assist in 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 constructing the books. So, you know, this is absolutely outrageous. And you know, I, I think what you're proposing is a very good idea. Uh, are you suggesting a couple of grand would make a difference here? Oh, I know that when I went from your standard, you know, eight gigabyte hard drive or eight gigabyte of RAM computer that I used to have, that was about like, you know, like a $500 computer. I upgraded to this you know, I think it has about 20 gigs of RAM now and, and a huge memory. It, it cost about uh, two to three grand. That was my last upgrade. So, I mean, something equivalent or somewhere around there, like this isn't something that's, you know, $20,000. This is like under five, four, five, something, three, something, you know, as cheap as we could possibly get it. To, like maybe I could even just take this in and get more, uh, you know, more. RAM put into this. Like I said, yeah. I'm not the most techie of the people. I'm kind of just here on the broadcast and research angle. Yeah. But uh, I really, you know, I would appreciate any help from anyone who's watching because you've got some some absolutely brilliant people in your chat room and in your uh, your fans. Well, let's see. Let's see. They know how to reach you at George at We Book Your Show. Uh, let's let's hope that those who are in the position where they might be able to make a a technical contribution or a financial contribution reach out to you. If you set up a site, let's see what we can do. Uh, I, I, I'm interested in the meanwhile chance in following up on the issue about the Jewish geometria. Uh, you're an expert in this area. I mean, it's obviously no coincidence that they were hanging uh, 10 uh, German generals or leaders on, on uh, Purim. I mean, this is really something striking in my opinion. Very suggestive of who was in control of the Nuremberg tribunals, just as Benton uh, was suggesting. And you know, uh, 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 I uh, bear no malice against any group. And, uh, I'm just interested in getting the facts straight. And it seems to me he's making a massive contribution to getting the facts straight. And that the accusation of anti Semitism is used constantly to divert attention from, for example, criticism of the apartheid policies of the Israeli government or its involvement in providing medical care for ISIS and a whole host of other issues where the Israeli government is ab abusing its authority and criticism is totally appropriate and it isn't any form of anti-Semitism. I'm just very interested in getting all this right. Now, uh, one of the things about, uh, like you were saying, the, the geometry is uh, what, what people don't realize is, is if you take a specific Bible verse, the, the Jewish people say that, or the Hebrew uh, rabbis say that there's at least four different ways to be able to interpret 
um, what a specific um, saying is in the Bible. So you have your literal, like, uh, you know, if it says in the beginning, they're, you know, they're saying it literally means in the beginning. Then you have your allegorical where it, you know, it's a metaphor for something. They have your um, uh, basically like your, your CIA and FBI where your beginning letter of each word represents an abbreviation that may be uh, another kind of uh, um, um, suggestion. But then it has the final one, which is where they take the numbers and assign them values to uh, the letters get assigned numbers to, to the, the values of the numbers and you can find hidden meanings in that. So um, one of the things that I like to go through is you take different words out of the Bible or different phrases and you can, you can actually find where they relate back to the number pi. And then if you realize that the Hebrew alphabet is 22 letters, and then that divides back in, you know, you divide that by seven, you're back into pi. So you can find many seven letter words that all end up having the same value. And, and, and a lot of it can take you really deep into some, some pretty, you know, fantastic things. And just like that, I think I lost Jim. Yep. So uh, anyone that's watching still um, on the live show, it's uh, been up and down all night. I've got my email right there, george at webookyourshow.com on screen. And uh, we're going to try and have some sort of GoFundMe or, or something like that. You've been watching The Real Deal with Jim Vesser. And uh, we're going to be back live on Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern Central Time. Thank you.